on the in inverse of the operator. And con conversely, if I had an a priori bound on this, you can reverse engineer this to conclude that you, can, that you have an a priori bound in LP on these objects over here. So let me not belabor this point. And I want to start now giving you a little bit sense of how you would see or understand when the solution of a normalized Riemann-Hilbert problem is, exists and is unique. Okay. Suppose F is equal to CH or CF of Z, F and LP, and G of Z equals C G of Z, where G belongs to LQ. And 1 over R, which is 1 over P plus 1 over Q, is less than or equal to 1. Then, Fg at Z is the Cauchy transform of some function H. And it's a little exercise to show that H on the contour is minus 1 upon 2i, G of S, H f of s plus f of s times h g of s. It's a simple little kind. So in other words, f g uh, f g belongs to boundary of c in L r because. If f is an LP, then the Hilbert transform of f is an LP. This is an LQ, so the product is an LR, okay, we, we have over here. And we have, connected with this fact, if we take fg plus the point z minus fg at point minus, that's just going to be this function h of z, because c plus minus c minus. Now you remember, c plus and c minus are bounded only if p is bigger than 1. But nevertheless, c plus and c minus are defined even if we're, the function h is just an L, L, L1. We just don't know it's a bounded operator. But you still have that fact. So now we have a theorem. So fix okay. Suppose M plus minus solves the normalized uh, Riemann Hilbert problem sigma B. Now suppose M plus minus inverse exists almost everywhere. And M plus minus inverse is equal to I C plus LQ. Where 1 over R equals 1 over p plus 1 over q less n. Right. Then m plus minus is unique. This is a uniqueness thing. So let me show you how you'd prove this because it's instructive. 
Now, suppose m hat plus minus equals 1 plus c plus minus h hat is a second solution. You don't need to assume this thing about m plus m hat inverse. Then uh, we have that m hat plus minus equals identity plus c plus minus of some function k. k is an LP. Now, you consider the following, m hat plus minus times m plus minus inverse minus 1. And you write it like this, m hat plus minus minus 1, m plus minus inverse minus 1, plus m hat plus minus minus the identity, plus m inverse plus minus minus the identity. So just writing it out. Now what we showed about capital F and capital G, this belongs to, this is equal to C plus minus of some function H, where H belongs to LR plus LP plus LQ. This product here belongs to LR. This object here is C plus minus or by assumption of LP, and we've got this. So immediately it follows from here. Lost my. So it follows that m plus hat times m plus minus minus m hat minus minus inverse is just h, because c plus minus c minus of h is the identity. But m hat plus times m plus minus is m hat minus v. And this is m minus v inverse. The v's cancel out, so this is m hat minus inverse. So this is equal to that. And therefore, h is 0, which means that this thing is 0, which means that m hat plus minus is equal to M plus one. So now what is really the issue here analytically? The issue is really this. Suppose that I have the real an analytical issue that I have. Suppose I've got a Riemann Hilbert problem for so M plus and I find that uh, some, let's call it uh, m plus equals m minus. So I've got something like this is equal to something like that. How do I know? So then I would know that m has an analytic continuation above and has an analytic continuation below. And I know that they match from the top and the bottom. So therefore, by Morera's theorem, you'd be able to conclude that the function m is entire. And you can work from that. But can you? Let me give you a trivial example. Let's suppose that uh, m plus, remember this is almost everywhere. Let's suppose that m plus equals m minus for all z belonging to r take away 0. So there's two functions which are analytic, uh, a function analytic above, analytic below. And it matches from the top and the bottom for all except one point. Can I then conclude that m is an entire function? The answer is no. I could just have m just to be the function 1 over z. Say. 
So the whole analysis is controlling the sense in which the function approaches the, the, the boundary. That's where the LP theory is really coming in. So I just wanted to bring us uh, this example to your mind, why there's an analytic component be there behind this. Now, uh, Now, the special features of Riemann-Hilbert problems for one-by-one -one matrices, the scalar case, I'll say more about that later, and also for problems uh, which are two-by-two. Two two. Many of the Riemann-Hilbert problems, but by no means all, involve two-by-two two, uh, two matrices. But here is a corollary. Suppose n is two and p is two. And if the determinant of V is just identically one, then you have uniqueness. Now, why do you have uniqueness? It's for the following reason, is that you have M plus equals M minus times V, which means that the determinant of M plus equals the determinant of m minus. So we're in exactly that kind of situation. But because of our assumptions that the function m plus is in, uh, m plus minus is in the boundary of the operator C, you know that if you write out m plus, it's gonna be something here times something there times something there times something there. This thing was going to be in some LR, where R is one over P plus uh, one, uh, uh, one over P plus one over P plus one over Q. So that will immediately tell you that the determinant of M plus, the, the determinant of M plus is entire. And because m plus minus is equal to one plus the boundary of some L2, L2 function, immediately you conclude that the determinant of m of z is just identically equal to one. So you know that. But now because you're dealing with the two, two by two, uh, two matrix, which has m11, m12, M21, M22, and its inverse is M22, M11 minus M12 minus M21. And because the determinant is one, you see you've got the same functions are lining up here. So this problem belongs to, if this belongs to boundary of C and L2, the same will be true for that one, and hence you can apply that lemma, so in other words, the condition on the in, inverse is automatic. Okay, now you will remember, so let me try and do this. So let's apply this to a real problem. Suppose we've got sigma equals r and vxt of z has the form 1 minus r squared minus r bar e to the minus 2 i tau or e to the 2 i tau 1 and tau was xz plus t times 4 times z cubed. x and t are space and time, they're real. Now, this Riemann Hilbert problem here arose, you will remember in the very first lecture, in the modified k, in analyzing the modified k, kdv equation. How do we know that the normalized Riemann Hilbert problem here exists? Now, there are different ways of doing this, but one way 
is to use a factorization uh, where w x t, remember, v is v plus, in, uh, v minus inverse times v plus, and v plus is 1 plus w plus, and v minus is 1 minus w minus, 1 minus then. So we define w x t to be 0, 0, 0 minus r bar e to the minus 2 i tau. And that's w plus, and the other is 0, 0 r e to the 2 i tau. So we're choosing a particular factorization to achieve a particular goal. What is the goal that we, achieve, we obtain is that you see that if you compute C, W, X, T, function H, and the norm we use is the Hilbert norm. In other words, if you've got a two by two matrix, the L2 norm is the sum of the squares of the L2, uh, the sum of the squares of the L2, oh, of each com co component. Then if you evaluate this, this turn turns out to be just equal to C minus H12 R e to the 2 i tau. C minus H22 of R e to the 2 i tau. I'm going to put over here C plus of H11 minus R e to the minus 2 i tau. And here I've got C minus H22 of R e to the, e to the plus 2 i tau. This squared. So in other words, with this judicious choice, we see that the whole action of the operator separates out. So the L2 norm is simply the sum of the norms of all these four components. But this is a bounded operator. And we have that C plus minus have both got norm 1 because they are projections. You can check that in this particular case. So the norm of this component squared is just the norm bounded by the norm of this times the sup norm of R. So you find that the norm of CWXT of H squared is bounded by R infinity norm of H squared. And for this particular problem, you might remember that the soup norm of R is strictly less than 1. And hence, you know that the norm of the operator C is less than 1. And therefore, 1 minus CW exists. So this is a judicious choice of the factorization. If you did a different one, uh, you wouldn't get that. So this is one way of proving existence and uniqueness. A different way of proving existence is just to observe, uh, a different way of proving uniqueness is just to observe that the determinant here is one. So hence, by the previous application, we get a second proof, not of existence, but of uniqueness. Now, this proof is really a judicious and fortunate combination of circumstances. This is not the general way you would try to prove that the problem has, has got a unique solution. The way you'd approach this more, more generally, and this makes the connection to what the theory is really about, is that the operator 1 minus c, which is a, bound, a bounded operator, is in fact a Fredholm operator. So I remind you, Fre Fredholm theory is the natural limit within functional analysis of the ideas of finite linear algebra. 
So find finite linear algebra is distinguished by the fact if I've got our operator A, its null space is fin finite dimensional and its co-dimension, co in other words, uh, is also fin uh, finite dimensional, obviously. So a Fredholm operator picks up on that. Uh, Fred, an operator is Fred, uh, Fredholm if and only if its null space is fin finite dimensional and its co-dimension co is fin finite dimensional. It's a most natural extension of the ideas and the methodology and the methods of finite linear algebra to the infinite dimensional case. The operator 1 minus C, the C is a Fredholm operator. Now, I just do not have the time to be able to show that. But I leave it to you as an exercise to do, do the following, is that we'll use the following fact. T is Fredholm, if and only if uh, there exists an operator S such that Fs is identity plus compact, and Sf, or well, S this is T, right? is also identity plus compact. It's called the pseudo-inverse. And what I leave for you as an exercise is to show that if we take, you can take any factorization, I'm going to take a trivial factor as v plus equals v, and v minus is the identity, then cw on h will just be c minus h of v minus 1. This is w. W plus. Now we introduce a new operator, each E C W tilde of H is just C minus of H V inverse. So this is very much in the spirit of pseudo differential operators. If you've got an operator, then the inverse symbol should tell you something about the operator. What it tell, t t tells you is that if you let this be your operator T, and you let this be your operator S, you can just verify these conditions. It relies on the fact that R is just a con continuous function which goes to, to zero. Now the general approach, the general approach to proving that a riemann hibble problem has got a solution, and the unique solution proceeds in the following way, and I wish I had time to follow through through in this case, but I don't. There's a three-step process. Step one, show CW is Fredholm. It's the first thing. You do a computation like that. In other words, there's a natural choice for the pseudo inverse. Next, you compute the index of CW, which is the dimension of the null space of CW min minus the co dimension of the operator CW. In other words, that's the dimension of uh, the ta target space factored by the range. And you want to show that this index is zero. And the third thing you do is to prove that the dimension of the null space of the operator is zero. With these facts, it immediately implies that the co-dimension co is zero, which means that the operator is a, su a subjection. Now, the way it would work in this particular case is you show that this operator here is Fred, uh, Fred Holm. But now you introduce, you replace R here by T times R. And the same proof but that you had will show that for any, t this is a bad symbol, let me call it uh, gamma times R. Then for any gamma, you prove that that operator is Fred, uh, Fred Hunt. But the fact of the matter is that if you have a family of operators parameterized by gamma, 
And for each gamma that you know the operator is Fred, uh, Fred Holm, and the operator depends continuously on gamma, then the index will be in independent of gamma. So what you do, it means that the index when gamma is 1 must be equal to the case when gamma is 0, when R just disappears from the story. And your operator, C, just becomes the trivial operator. So 1 minus C is clearly a bijection, and it's invertible. Then you're left with showing that the kernel is empty, that the, the dimension of the kernel is empty. I don't have time to do that, but why this is important is in, for example, this is the Riemann Hilbert problem you get for the modified KDV. Now, the modified K KDV is sort of the poor relation, for want of a word, of the KDV equation. The KDV equation is the king of all equations, right? All non nonlinear equations. And for KDV, this condition breaks down. So for KDV, R of Z, the Riemann Hilbert problem looks exactly like that one, but R of Z is less than 1 as long as Z belongs to R, take away 0. But R of 0 is generically equal to minus 1. So the soup. Now, this is not just a technical matter. If you look at the long-time be, 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 uh, behavior of solutions of the K, K, KDB using the steepest ascent method, et cetera, you find that there is an asymptotic region which arises specifically from this problem, very interesting region called the collisionless shock region. So there's real physics associated with this phenomenon. But what it means is that you can't use this argument to prove that the norm of the operator is strictly less than 1. But this approach works. So that's a key example of how things go. Uh, if you look at the notes, you'll find that this argument is lay laid out. And I'm sorry that I just can't do that. Uh, OK. Now, let me just take two minutes, if I could. The, I mentioned that Riemann Hilbert -Hil -Hil problems of size 1 and 2 are special. We saw in what sense the case where the matrices are 2, two by 2 is spe special in the sense that the in inverse is essentially the same kind of function as the matrix itself. But just the case where we have scalar problems scalar case means you can take the logarithm of m plus the logarithm of m minus plus the logarithm of v and this is a kind of problem which is clearly solved just the cauchy transform v of s, d bar s, on s minus z, because log m plus minus log m plus, uh, log m minus is just the log of v. So you've got an explicit solution of e to the integral over r, log of v of s upon s minus z, d bar s. So it seems that you've solved the problem by form formula. You know the logarithm of a product of the two, two sca scalars is uh, the sum of the logs. But the logarithm of a product of matrices is what? In fact, the whole theory of Riemann-Hilbert Riemann problem can be viewed as trying to understand what the logarithm of a product of two uh, non-scalar -scalar matrices is. It's getting round, round that issue. But have you really solved the problem? We would have a situation where v of z goes to 1. So this looks good. Log of v goes to 0. But does it go to 0? It may, it may go to 0 on one side, but there could be winding. 
and at minus infinity it could go to, to, to 2 pi i. So you see a very important hit point here which would really alert you that there are subtle fundamental obstacles to solving a Riemann, Riemann Hilbert problem. There are topological obstacles. And when you're looking at the matrix case, you'll find that these obstacles are present. So far we've spoken about when you can solve it, haven't spoken about what happens when you can't, can't solve it, and there will be very subtle factors which come in. Okay, thank you. Okay, so maybe time just for one very short question. There is. If not, uh, let's thank Percy again. And we resume in 10 minutes. <laughs>